Hello, and welcome to the Tale of Two Bobs episode of Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Hammond of Axios. My colleague Emily Peck is also here. Hello, hello. I'm also joined by Elizabeth Spires. Hello. And we are going to talk about two bobs, the <laughs> Iger and the Chapek, um, and all of what went down at Disney. We're going to talk about narcissistic CEOs, not only in the context of Disney, but also in the context of FTX. We are going to talk about shrinkflation in Slate Plus. We're going to talk about Balenciaga. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Slate Money is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Hey there, Slate Money listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our sponsors, Charles Schwab. Schwab's passion for serving clients is inspired directly by the values of the people who work there. It's what sets them apart. Stick around to hear how Jim's approach as a Schwab financial consultant was shaped by values instilled by his father. Uh, So, Emily, can you catch me up since we got waylaid by Taffy Brothers at Acne last week um, and missed the big news at the company for which she has been working for the past year or so, which Mm -hmm. is that it was run by a man named Bob. He quit and was replaced by a man named Bob. And then that man named Bob was fired and replaced by the original man named Bob. Is that about the, the, the long and short of it? Yeah, that's a very clear explanation, Felix. I don't think I need to (laughs) clarify all that much. Segment done. I (laughs) I guess I'll say, um, it was a Sunday night, November, when Disney announced that Bob Chapek was leaving and Bob Iger was going to come back. Iger was the super successful former CEO who was there for 15 years, did some of the biggest, awesomest deals that everyone thinks Disney's great for, like Pixar and Marvel and um, Lucasfilms, like making Disney. He basically made Disney into this massive juggernaut. He picked Bob Chapek to replace him after a bunch of angst and agita and like didn't want to leave kind of holding on to the glory situation. He finally picked this guy, Bob Chapek to replace him. The timing was terrible. Chapek came on during, I think right before the pandemic and the pandemic hit and you know, it was bad for Disney, right? They had to shut, shut their parks for a while, all of that. Um, and then Chapek, I think we could, we'll talk about it, but I think he kind of bungled the whole thing for himself. And Iger also from his new role as chairman kind of meddled with him quite a bit. And it all culminated in this Sunday night news dump where one Bob came back to replace another. (laughs) So my take on this that that I, you know, put in my newsletter was basically it, defies comprehension that they would bring back the man who failed at his most important job, which is making sure that Disney was set for the long term. That is the job of the CEO is to create a strategic long term path that doesn't just come to a shuddering halt the minute you leave the building. Right. And not only was that job as that was that Bob Iger's job as CEO, but more importantly, that was his job as chairman of the board because of course you know this being the bob Iger fiefdom um he was not only ceo but also board chair so he was doubly responsible for making sure that the company was on a long-term good footing and he 
ran through a bunch of deputies who people thought were the heir apparent and then turned out not to be. He finally alights on this guy from Parks. He gives him the strategy, right? He's like, I'm the board chair. I came up with a strategy, which is streaming, streaming, streaming. We can lose lots of money so long as we have a successful streaming platform. And then JPEG, who like inherits the strategy, has no ability to really change that strategy because he came from Parks and doesn't really know entertainment. Um, winds up seeing the share price go up quite a lot as everyone starts streaming during the pandemic and then come down quite a lot with all of the other streamers when the, you know, when the markets change. And what happens to Disney also happens to, you know, every other streamer out there. Um, And for this sin, he gets fired and replaced by the guy who apparently, you know, is the only man capable of running Disney. The whole thing just... and Oh, and by the way, my favorite part of this entire thing was the reporting, which said that the board, which eventually managed to get rid of Paul Baiger as chair, which he, he was replaced by um, Susan Arnold. The board, you want, you want to know how many other people they considered when they decided that JPEG wasn't working? Zero. They... They just asked Bob Iger, will you come back and we will interview zero other people for your former job? It's insane. Well, there's a there's a good Wall Street Journal piece by Ben Cohen today that sort of raised the question of whether CEOs are really even capable of hiring their own replacements. And I've you know been in jobs before where you, you, you leave and you are tasked with doing that. But in the case of a lot of CEOs, there, there's maybe a incentive misalignment where you want to hire somebody who is good, but not so good that, you know, they, they uh, surpass your own legacy. And, and there was some speculation that that's part when, of what why, why, Like, yeah, no, mm-hmm. I, I don't buy that. I really don't. I feel like getting the succession thing right is a key part of your legacy. If you get the succession right, if you manage to set your success up for even more success that you, than you had, that's awesome. Like, Bob, in theory, but these like are people Mike with Eisner, big, big Eisner egos. Does, <laughs> right, I know, but like we're talking about Hollywood egos here. But I'm just saying, like Mike Eisner, who is Bob Iger's predecessor at Disney, does not is not like his legacy is in no way tarnished by the fact that he set up Iger for success. Well, the, you know? the the other factor too, though, is is you know if you're a CEO, does that mean that you're good at recruiting another CEO or identifying another CEO? That that it could be it a completely should be, yeah. separate skill set potentially. I don't. I think I think that's a really good point. I think it is a separate skill set, and I think CEO is like this ego, or can be this like narcissistic, ego driven role. And I think for someone like that, it can be really hard to think, I'm going to find someone better than me because he is usually thinking, there is no one better than me. (laughs) And you can kind of see that in Iger's behavior because when the pandemic struck and Chapek was in place, he gave some interview. I forget to that which outlet. He gave an interview in which he was like, "I'm here to help if Bob needs me." Oh this yeah. By, by the way, right this here, is ready, yeah. really like screwed up their relationship. This, and this this predates the pandemic, by the way. This is this, and I wrote this at the time. I, I, I'm rarely right, but in this case, I was actually right. That the <laughs> the one thing that Bob Iger did that was just unconscionable when he stepped down as CEO, was he appointed himself this ludicrous job, executive chairman, which should Mm -hmm. never exist. And I think I've talked about this on the pod before, before, but it's one of my hobby horses. No one should ever be executive chairman. Executive chairman is the worst job you can ever have because you are both the chairman, which means you are the boss of the CEO, but you are also an executive, which means you work for the company and you report up to the CEO in some way, right? You are, you know, you are working in the company and the CEO has to be able to tell you what to do. Otherwise, they're not actually the chief executive in the company. So it's this weird paradoxical job that Bob Iger gave himself, executive chair, um, which completely undercuts any authority that JPEG has. And so that's from day one. Then, like, day two, the pandemic hits, and and I guess, like, oh, shit, like, I completely fucked up here and I made a mistake, but now it's too late. Um, but, Elizabeth, to your point of, like, is it a different skill set to be able to pick a successor than to be able to run a company? Sure, maybe. But the skill set is precisely the job description 
Or, so, but the skill set is precisely the job description of board chair, right? If mm. you don't have that skill set, you should never be board chair. I mean, in general, the CEO should never be the board chair, but especially not if the CEO doesn't have that skill set. Um, there's also some good examples of other handpicked successors who were bad. And if you think about the the person doing the picking, it it kind of backs up my narcissist ego theory. Jeff Immelt, handpicked by Jack Welch, disaster. Also, by the way, he was the guy who started on 9-11, right? Like, if you, if you start, <laughs> okay, if, you, if your first day is like a, an entire crisis hits the entire company, that's never a good sign. Yeah, but if you're a really good CEO, you can like turn that around somehow, right? My, my question is, what, what's the alternative? Do you hire a really good executive recruiter and give them equity? Like, what, what, what would, how, how would this be done better? Hmm. Ask Steve, well, I was going to say Steve Jobs picking Tim Cook, but I, I don't know. No, Steve Jobs did a really uh, amazing job there, right? I mean, like, that is a clear example of successful succession planning. An even better example, in a weird way, um, is Steve Ballmer, who was no one's idea of a great Microsoft CEO, right? Who sort of came in after the legendary Bill Gates kind of ran Microsoft sideways, did a bunch of weird misadventures in phones. Like, I know, we, this is why we're all, you know, using Microsoft phones right now. Um, and then eventually said, okay, I, I'm no good at this, and picked Satya Nadella, who turned out to be mm. amazing and was like this <clears throat> super effective CEO who really came in and got shit done. Um, mm -hmm. Like, Steve Bellman might not have been a good CEO, but he was incredibly good at succession planning. Right, he he managed to find exactly the right person to take over. Yeah, and now we should talk about. I mean, Bob Iger isn't the first CEO to do a comeback tour. Steve Jobs did a come. He came well, back the, to the Apple. Rest, the rest seem to be founders, right? Like, there's a lot of like you know Howard Schultz types who can't yeah. let go and and come back to their com to the company that they that they founded. I'm 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 sure there are other examples of you know, employee CEOs rather than founder CEOs who come back. But I think that's rarer because normally like the board is like, okay, you know, you've had your tour of duty. We're not going to bring you back again. Yeah. I think the, all the ones on my list, it was like Howard Schultz to Starbucks famously like three times and Jack Dorsey to Twitter, Michael Dell to Dell, obviously a founder didn't go well for him, but I guess it did long-term something, something, he took it private. Um, but I don't have anyone on my list that wasn't a founder. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, also, I want to just, we should maybe mention that Chapek really didn't seem like a good CEO for Disney. Like he made some missteps. Yes? So he made, he, he made a couple of like PR missteps, right? Um, he kind of mishandled the whole don't say gay bill in Florida and, and that thing. And he mishandled the relationships with one of his stars, Scarlett Johansson, when she sued the company. Um, you know, she's not a good look for Disney. But when it comes to that kind of, like those kind of PR missteps are not firing offenses for a CEO, right? Um, the bigger misstep that he made coming from Parks was that I think he massively misjudged the power of the creatives in a creative organization. And he took a bunch of power, he took a bunch of decision-making ability away from them. And he's like, I'm not going to allow you to like green light $100 million movies anymore. Like, you know, I want to make sure that those decisions are made sort of within corporate by bean counters. And all of the creatives hated that. And they pushed back against him. And Bob Iger was famously always on very good terms with the creative. So what they would do, especially when Bob Iger was executive chairman and was like in charge of creativity or whatever the hell meaningless job he gave himself was, um, was they would moan to him, right? They would go up to Bob and Iger and say, oh my God, this new boss, he's terrible. He's not allowing us to, you know, implement our amazing visions. And Iger would nod and agree and leak stuff to the press about how terrible JPEG was and basically undercut JPEG and make his job impossible. Um, Iger also had this longstanding CFO who um, went along with whatever JPEG said he wanted, but was also like briefing against him, conspiring with Iger and ultimately complaining to the bar, to, to the board about like, I can't work with this guy JPEG anymore. And, and sort of 
wound up being the the cause by all reporting of of JPEG's defenestration. So it's yeah, it it was it was clearly a political snake pit. You know, I don't know how JPEG could have survived, but yeah, I'm not going to say he was a good CEO. He, this is the guy who brought in McKinsey to sort of, you know, find cost cuts. You know, that's never It, a, it seemed like he fundamentally misunderstood what Disney's core product is now. You know, it, it's it came out of parks, doesn't really I think understand media and entertainment where those things are the product. The creativity is the product. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, you know, he he stuck with the strategy, right? Which was like, just go all in on Disney Plus. And the markets didn't like it. Ultimately, there was one reason why JPEG got fired. And that is that the stock went down. If the stock had kept on going up, he would never have got mm. fired. The minute the stock went down, he got fired. This is how the life of the CEO is these days. Um, it's about the stock price. And if you look at the makeup of the Disney board that fired JPEG, I had a look at this. It was absolutely amazing. I couldn't, couldn't believe it. Every single member of the board that fired JPEG had zero experience in the entertainment industry. Wow. They finally brought on one new person, Carolyn Everson, who had a little bit of experience in that, in like media, but she joined the board literally the day after he was fired. But Felix, if if CEOs get fired when the stock goes down, shouldn't there be a lot of CEOs that just got fired in the past few months where everyone's stock just went down? Like Mark Zuckerberg, out. Be well, out, well, right? well, yeah, he should be out. I mean, he should he have been fired a million that's a, times. The but he, control, of the he, stock he controls is, the yeah. yeah, that's yeah, exactly. He controls the board, so like he would have to fire himself. Oh, okay, but like the S and P is down. I don't know how much is it down this year. Like eleven percent. Not, not that much. Yeah, stocks are down. So Some by your theory, all the CEOs should be gone. No, that's that. No, no, no. You, <laughs> you're misunderstanding me entirely. Like I'm saying, this is a terrible reason. Like. If you look at, say, um, all of the other streamers, right, the, the boards of all of the other streamers are saying, well, this is happening to everyone. This is not uniquely your problem. This is an industry mm -hmm. thing. You know, the market valued streamers at this kind of multiple a year ago, and it's now right. multiplying, valuing streamers at that kind of multiple today. This is not your fault. We're not going to fire you for that. Right. The, only, the only place where where, you know, the CEO of a streamer got blamed for that and fired was Disney. Now, I'm not saying like, uh, yeah, but I'm just saying that was necessary and sufficient for him to be fired. But like most boards were slightly more intelligent than that and didn't do that. So I think they just didn't like him. I'm this sure they matter. didn't. I think that's I mean, right. Why but is he messing with ScarJo? To me, that, <laughs> that's the signifier for how if you, bad if you he don't, was. If you don't like the CEO and you think he should be replaced, then as a board, what you do is you start looking for a replacement. Him. You don't panic and bring in the uh, guy who fucked up the last time. But he only messed up that one thing. Wait, have we forgotten You know, spending <laughs> $20 billion on Fox? Like no one thinks that was a good deal. Like but he all of the Pixar, other deals were good deals. Marvel deal. and Lucas Films, like that. Is, I mean, those are massive in their own right. Each deal, billions right, and billions, so, so, right. billions and billions, and all the IP. My God. No, no, but can, let's be clear about no. Let's be clear about this. Let's be clear. That that was deal making, right? Mm -hmm. um, I got you know he was good at being nice to creatives. He was good at managing down. I'm not going to say he was a bad CEO. He was a good CEO. Uh -huh. but the, the legacy, <laughs> the real legacy of his time in Disney is those three acquisitions. Not, yes. not Fox. The first three, not the fourth. The fourth, by the way, was much bigger than the other three combined. But the first three acquisitions were the thing that really cemented his legacy at Disney. Those were, you know... Strategic decisions, which he should get a lot of credit for, but which everyone at the time, really, the credit for those acquisitions went to Kevin Mayer, not to um, Bob Iger. Kevin Mayer was the guy who was apparently going to take over for Iger until he wasn't, and who really spent all of his time looking strategically at those things, doing the negotiations, putting those deals together. Those deals were Kevin Mayer deals, at least as much as they were Bob Iger deals. I don't think JPEG would have made those deals. 
Now I'm just completely yeah. making stuff up. I have no idea. <laughs> but it seems to me that the guy who fought with Scarlett Johansson could not <laughs> negotiate a Diplomatic deal with Diplomatic skills Steve are, Jobs are subpar just based on that. So, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. In, in, in any exactly. case, the, the stated job of Bob Iger at this point is to find a successor at some point in the next two years. Um, the fact that he is a deal maker and that everything – he ever got credit for is basically a function of those three acquisitions leads certain people to believe that while ostensibly looking for a successor, what he's actually going to do is look for one last final career topping deal, oh, which, no. you know, is let's sell Disney to Apple. Oh no. Oh, interesting. <laughs> that could work. I, I don't, terrible. I don't think that Apple has any particular interest in buying Disney. But, like, I feel like that is a good way of him, like, ducking the whole issue of um, who's going to replace me. It's just by like, yeah. like, yeah, hand, handing that decision over to Tim Cook. That would also thread the needle for, uh, you know, Emily and, and partially my theory about narcissism. Because then he wouldn't really have to worry about legacy in, in that sense. Good stuff. <laughs> Real life succession drama. Yes. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Now through December 25th, get 5% daily cash back on products at Apple with a new Apple Card, including a new iPhone 14 or Apple Watch Ultra. And everywhere else, Apple Card gives you up to 3% unlimited daily cash back on everything you buy. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, monthly financing through Apple Card monthly installments is ineligible to earn 5% back. Additional exclusions apply. Valid only on qualifying U.S. purchases for new Apple Card customers who open an account and use it from December 1st to 25th, 2022 at Apple. Visit apple.co slash save5 for more details. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account that lets you send, spend, and receive money internationally. With one account for over 50 currencies, who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for Austrians, uprooting to Australia, Swedes, safariing in South Africa. It's made for business in Tokyo and pleasure in Miami. WISE is made for people without borders. People who believe that using your money should be easy, even if life gets complicated. You see, with WISE, you always get the mid-market exchange rate with no markups and no hidden fees, helping you save on currency conversion wherever your money takes you. WISE. It's the account that's made for the world. Join 13 million customers and learn how the WISE account could work for you at wise.com slash slate money. Can we talk about notifications for a second? Who actually leaves those sounds on anymore? Well, beside that kind. That's another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere, whether your thing is vintage teas or recipes. Start selling with Shopify and join the platform simplifying commerce for millions of your favorite businesses worldwide. So, I mean, I've always kind of wanted to start my own business, and it's cool to know that Shopify is out there if I ever take that big step into the entrepreneurial world. When I'm ready or when you're ready to launch your thing into the spotlight, do it with Shopify, the commerce platform backing millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash money all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash money to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash money. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about this curious media tour that Sam Bankman Freed is now on. We've talked at length now about the facts of what happened to FTX and the fact that it's in bankruptcy. And let's put all of that, like what happened to FTX, what happened at Alameda aside and start and stick to this question of narcissistic CEOs and ask ourselves, what the hell does Sam Bankman-Fried 
think he's doing. He's giving interviews, not just like a Twitter DM interview to Kelsey Piper at Vox, which like he claims he wasn't sure was on the record, but on the record interviews to New York Magazine, to Axios, to the New York Times, to Good Morning America, to basically anyone who will listen to some random YouTuber who just called him up one day and he's like, I'll tell you everything. And he, you know, he did a massive Twitter spaces this week where, you know, 30,000 people tuned in to listen to him talking to, you know, Kim.com and people like that about like what happened. He is really out there, very visible, running through lawyers like other people will run through toilet paper. You know, it's just like they are all just dumping him because he is doing the one thing that every lawyer will tell him, which is just don't talk to people. Shut up. Shut up. There, there is a there is a thing in Deal Book this morning where he was quoted as saying something like, "I'm not taking the quote classic advice <laughs> route of of not not talking as if as if he's positioning it like he he's innovating here. <laughs> not he's a renegade. Not just yeah. uh, you know being and he is about he it, is the so. son of two law professors. Like on some level, he does respect lawyers and understand that they generally can have something intelligent to say. Or maybe he hates his parents he and does. he doesn't. Like, I think he has a very close relationship to his parents. <laughs> um, in yet another interview with Bloomberg Businessweek that I was looking at today, the author has a, a good theory or a theory I liked about why Sam Bankman-Fried won't shut up, which was the press helped him create his only honest man in crypto image. So why not use them to talk his way out of trouble? Do we think he's that sophisticated about it? We, so yeah, we do. Okay, I think I think that he we. Uh, so there was a very interesting Substack post by Lulu Chang Maservi, who used to be the PR chief of Substack and is now something something else. Um, basically, detailing all the ways in which his PR strategy was very smart. He was clearly very conscious of having a smart PR strategy. He has said this explicitly on the record to people like Kelsey Piper, basically saying, oh, yeah, um, you know, I was careful to use all of these shibboleths to get the press on board. He told the YouTube woman that he gave roughly equal amounts of money to Democrats and Republicans, but he kept all of the Republican donations dark and made a big noise about the Democratic ones so that the, you know, because he reckoned that would get him in the good graces of the liberal media. And he wasn't wrong about that. Um, and he definitely was extremely good at making himself available to journalists and being very open and honest with them except for when he wasn't obviously about like he 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 became like the go-to person to talk to about crypto because he was that available and that worked for him for many years and maybe he thinks this will continue to work for him and certainly you know, now we have people like bill ackman coming out on twitter saying i believe him and the really interesting question is Let's say it works. Let's say that with all of these interviews, he brings public opinion around to his story here, which is he was not trying to defraud people. He was not deliberately running any kind of a Ponzi. This was a cock up mother conspiracy. This was just him making mistakes rather than actively and cunningly, cunningly stealing money from people. Um, if that is true, what happens in some sort of hypothetical future courtroom? Um, there are two very interesting, completely disparate points of view here. One point of view is if you believe him and he's like, I fucked up, but it wasn't really my fault. I didn't do it deliberately. It was my fault, but I didn't do it deliberately. Then a jury might be more likely to be lenient or find him innocent on various charges. The other point of view is he has just admitted to all of these crimes. And, you know, not doing it deliberately is no excuse. And if you're, if you're on the record multiple times saying, yeah, I did this, I did this, I did this, then that is the most slam dunk conviction you can possibly imagine. I mean, in theory, but we also just had a, you know, president for four years who, who did that every day. Yeah, he ne he <laughs> never came up for trial in the courtroom, right? Right. 
this is this is the question like what happens in a criminal courtroom if and when he, you know he finally finds himself in that position that i think is the it's the strategy if there is a strategy here the idea is that he is bringing public opinion around to this idea that he did it but it wasn't deliberate and i don't know whether that's i, I don't know whether that's like um something that juries care about whether it was deliberate or not yeah he keeps using language that sounds very um you know like uh, not quite legalese but he keeps inserting like i did not knowingly commingle funds or i didn't knowingly do x and you know in in theory the law says doesn't matter if your you know, ignorance of the law doesn't matter you're you still did this bad thing um but he's he keeps sort of adding these qualifiers anytime he admits to something he says uh you know but i didn't understand that this was blah 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 or i didn't know that this was happening and i guess it might be mitigating in in terms of whether people have sympathy for him but i don't know that it really makes a difference legally there is one other aspect here which i think is important which is that sam bankman fried is a creature of the cryptoverse he his entire career insofar as it matters has been spent in and around you know people who care deeply about crypto are fully invested in crypto in one way or another it's a relatively tight-knit community although obviously there's a lot of enmities in there as well and the cryptoverse has almost unanimously decided that he is the greatest villain in the history of corporate villainy and that he is persona non grata and that no press should even talk to him and that he is the worst fraudster ever and he is a terrible person and there is a reason why they have come to this very quick and um extremely negative conclusion about a man who they lauded up until a month ago and that is that they need him to be a villain in order for crypto itself to have any future because if this kind of thing can happen inadvertently by mistake as sam bankman fried is basically saying then that is not just an indictment of sam bankman fried and his management abilities that is an indictment of the entire crypto ecosystem and it will happen over and over again that, that's a good point and i think uh you know the, the now once you sort of understand that all of the the coverage makes sense because if you think of him as an outlier then you know it, it sort of follows that there's nothing wrong systemically with the cryptoverse that makes me wonder which story is right i feel like like most things it's a little bit of each yeah I, yeah <laughs> there's I, something wrong i i don't i don't think he i don't stuff. think that he is doing like cunning lies on this media tour right i don't think he is strategically trying to persuade people of things that aren't true for the sake of whatever like um weird plan that he has in mind but i do think he is you know at least as much of a narcissist as bob Iger, if not more and you know this is his last chance to bask in public attention until, you know, he gets locked up. It's weird how I, I'm not, of course, like if he wants to talk, I, I totally understand why Andrew Ross Sorkin, and George Stephanopoulos and on and on, everyone's talking to him. That said, yuck. Like <laughs> I, I, if someone did murder, <laughs> let's say, or was accused of murder, like, would they go on a press tour? And if they wanted to go on a press tour, would everyone yeah, that, talk there to there them? Would be, Probably, there would be right? 8 million but true crime podcasters lining up to <sighs> interview them. But it's yucky. Like, why give a, a, a more of a, I mean, I know I get it. Like, and I, again, like, if he called me up, I'd be like, oh my God. And I'd run to my editor <laughs> and say, let's run this interview that I just got. Like, I know that. But at the same time, it, there's something really like reprehensible about how the media and the business press built this guy up into some kind of like superhero, put him on the cover of everything like they always do, Elizabeth Holmes, whatever. And now they're doing kind of the same thing. It's still well, going is, on. I don't think his media tour is working. Like, I, I don't think it's convincing people that he's not a fraudster, or that he didn't. Oh, it certainly you isn't. Know. I, like, and it, the universal reaction to the 
deal book interview and to pretty much all of the other ones is, oh my God, this guy is terrible. And like, this is the most damning interview that I've ever seen, right? Like he is damning himself with every interview he gives. On some level, I think he has to know that. And why does he admit the other stuff? Like, why is he like, oh yeah, um, well, I was a negligent CEO and I didn't manage risk at all, but also I didn't believe in effective altruism, but also <laughs> I donated to Republicans. Like, it just seems like, it might be there's a, that, that, a true crime trope where the, the killers want to confess on some level, so they just right. blurt it, it all out. It is, in, it is interesting. <laughs> like, Fine, I was actually terrible all along. I, I, haven't, I haven't done a good job of keeping up with the like the more mainstream interviews like New York Times and New York Magazine, but it seems to me that the more damning admissions about things like effective altruism and Republican donations are the ones that he's giving to um, people he considers – his friends rather than adversarial journalists. Yeah, I think that's right. Like George Stephanopoulos didn't care to even ask from the clip I saw about effective altruism. Like GMA doesn't care about that. It was just like, why'd you steal people's money though? Right. You know, so that makes sense. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Charles Schwab. The people at Charles Schwab go the extra mile to help clients on their investment journey. It's part of who they are. Jim is a Schwab financial consultant. His dad was a contractor who prided himself on providing great work at a fair price. You know, I can remember installing windows with my dad and would have to go order the windows from the distributor. And um, we could have bought cheaper windows. He's like, no, I don't want to buy those if I put those in. Winter's going to come. They're going to be cold. My dad instilled in me be proud of offering a good quality product at a fair price. Jim brings this integrity to how he serves his clients each and every day. I know from 20 years of doing this that if you just help people and give them the guidance that they're looking for, it'll work out in the long run. They don't have to buy anything from you today. They don't have to pay you any money or commissions today. People are looking for good, honest, quality, intelligent service. I always put the people before the money. Always. At Charles Schwab, they're not just financial people. They're people people too. With 24-7 support and one-on-one -on -one guidance from financial consultants, Schwab offers the tools to help you pursue your financial goals. Learn more about what sets Schwab apart at schwab.com slash why Schwab. This episode of Slate Money is brought to you by Best Buy. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts, trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, or looking for ways to simplify the giving and receiving experience, Best Buy is here to help. They have the best assortment of impactful tech gifts. They have, I don't know, an air fryer if you want to help an aspiring foodie in your life, or a new phone, or a camera. Or you might be on the hunt for a new smartwatch to support a friend's wellness journey. No matter what you're looking for, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next-day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same-day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. Um, Emily, I know that you, more than anyone else on this podcast, care about the inflation. You're the queen of the inflation. So Thank can you. we talk about the shrinkflation? Yeah, let's get into it. Let's talk what about it. What is the shrinkflation? <laughs> shrinkflation, Felix, is a term um, for when a company reduces the size of its packaging in some way that's like very subtle, you might not notice, doesn't change the price, but all of a sudden you're paying the same price for a little less. So like your box of cereal gets a little smaller or this one hurts me, the pint of ice cream that's like 14 and a half ounces. Why? The, the, the thing that gets me is the pound of coffee that's 12 ounces. Yes. When did all coffee become 12 ounces? That's how they get you. That's shrinkflation. And sometimes eight ounces yes. now. Sometimes it's like, you know, a half pound of coffee is a new pound of coffee. <laughs> it's 
So people really hate this. <laughs> and I, of course, hate it. I mean, I don't know. It's whatever. It, it is what it is, but we hate it. And the New York Times had a nice um, profile of this fellow named Edgar Dworsky, who is a 71-year-old semi-retired lawyer who lives in Massachusetts and only makes $7,000 a year and like eats every, you know, buys everything on sale and whatnot and tracks all this shrinkflation on his website. And the author of the piece like goes around Massachusetts, his his town with him to all the pharmacies to check on like cough syrup shrinkflation, which golly, like I I don't I wouldn't even know to care about that. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about it a little. Does it bother you, Elizabeth? Uh yeah, because I, I feel like it's it's sort of uh, you know deceiving consumers. Um, I understand why it happens. It, it certainly. It, if you know the consumers are just looking at the price and not really paying attention to the quantity of product they're getting, then it's a way to handle, uh, you know, in, inflationary measures in a way that maybe like you think consumers won't notice. And most of the time they don't. Like I wouldn't notice if cough syrup was suddenly packaged in a right. smaller bottle. So can I can I ask you guys about this thing that is almost ubiquitous in supermarkets now. The, these little liquid crystal price displays for all of the items on supermarket shelves, which display not only the price, but also the price per pound the or unit ounce price. or count the unit price. Mm -hmm. And supermarkets have been, I think, pretty good in general, in principle, about displaying the unit price alongside the actual price, precisely in order to make the shrinkflation much more obvious and to be able to make compar you know, price comparisons much easier. Um, in practice, I find those unit prices weirdly confusing and often just way massively weirdly inaccurate. And I don't think the supermarkets put a huge amount of effort into making sure that they're correct. But in principle, I think this should be like a pretty strong solution to this problem. Yeah, I think um, some municipalities, governments, I found a story on Bloomberg that's talked about shrinkflation, dates back to the high inflation era of the 70s and probably earlier. And I think starting back then is when these unit price requirements were put in place. And I agree that they don't always really help very much. You wind up kind of like looking at the coffee, the small bag, the big bag, and like doing the math in your head. Should I spend $15 for this big bag? But this one's seven. And yeah, you can get really. So lost. as a, as a consumer, Emily, you know, you are my pl platonic ideal of the, you know, someone who shops in the suburban <laughs> supermarket. Like why, what is it? What is it that's confusing about those unit price <laughs> You're the one who said he's confused. Things on the shelves? <laughs> I'm confused, but I don't know why I'm confused. And I want you to explain it to me. Like I feel like this is a pro this is a solved problem. We found a solution to the problem, but the solution turned out not to be nearly as good as we thought it would be. When why is it that you know someone like you who cares about inflation, who cares about shrinkflation, doesn't just look at the unit price when you go shopping? I mean. First, I would say that I am not the primary food shopper in my house, so just know that. Um, second, to quote Barbie from the 90s, math is hard, and when you go to the supermarket, you don't want to be, like, <laughs> doing the math on everything you pick up. You know, when you go food shopping for your family, you're going to buy, like, what, like 60 items? You're not going to do the math on every item. It It's not really helpful, bottom line. It's it's It's... When you're doing calculations in your head to figure out what size box of cereal to buy, like you've lost, <laughs> like the unit price isn't helping you. Right, but that's but that's yeah. that's a uh, that's something which is true of inflation just as much as it's true of shrinkflation, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the the idea that shrinkflation is somehow worse than inflation because it's somehow less obvious. And you like we have we not solved that? Have we solved that problem through these clever, you know, mathematical shelf price things, or have we not? I don't think I don't think we have. I don't think people really even register them, and I don't think that most people even know what shrinkflation is or or, or notice it materially. Um, yeah, and I mean, I was thinking about that. Like everyone who knows about shrinkflation, which I guess isn't everyone, doesn't like it. 
But the alternative would be everything costs more, just everything costs more, you know, like your box of cereal is $7 or something instead of you buy a little smaller box of cereal and maybe you don't notice or eat less. I mean, it is it is interesting to think about if everybody did know this was happening and, and noticed it, would that be worse than, you know, the, the way people perceive inflation? Because, the you know, loss aversion is a very powerful bias. If, if you think that you're getting less for what you're paying, would that be worse than just saying, just raising right, the price on something? Wait, what, I don't, I, wait, wait, what do you mean by worse? Worse for who? For the average consumer. If, if they understand that shrinkflation is happening, would they, and they had to choose between, you know, a price going up on, you know, a, a larger bag of coffee or same price, smaller bag of coffee? What, yeah, what do they what pick? what do you pick, Felix? Do you want, would you rather pay more and get the same size coffee bag or just pay the same and get a little less coffee? I think we are habituated to certain sizes. Um, and we are creatures of habit. And one of the reasons why we don't like shrinkflation is because we have to wind up building new routines and new habits to accommodate the new sizes, right? If the bag of coffee goes down from 16 ounces to 12 ounces, then I have to buy a bag of coffee significantly more frequently mm. than I would have done mm -hmm. previously. And that routine of like, oh, I need to go out and buy a new bag of coffee. Um, you know, I need to change that routine and that's annoying. Um, it's not the question of like, what's better, bigger or smaller. You know, there, there are advantages to doing it more frequently. You get fresher coffee, you know, great. But there are also, the, the, dif the difficulty is the change rather than the fact that it's smaller. I think once people get into a routine and are used to something, then changing that thing in any way is annoying to them. And in a weird way, just changing the price of it is the, is the least annoying thing because like, you know, prices go up, sometimes prices go down, it's all good. Right. But like, um, it, you don't need to change your actual day-to-day -day habits mm -hmm. when the price change in the way that you do when the when the quantity changes. Yeah, like I can't eat a full pint anymore standing up in front of my freezer feeling bad about myself. Like it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so. Gah. So mean, Flesh. those ice cream people. In flesh. Um, Should we have a numbers round? Felix, what's your number? I heard it's good. <laughs> <laughs> my number is... 10.5 million, which is the number of hectoliters of wine that China consumed in 2021. What's a hectoliter? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of liters. <laughs> um, but it's a small number. 10.5 is, or 10.5 million is a small number. And it's down um, from almost 20 million in 2017, it has shrunk by 45% in just four years. And to get this, it is lower than any year since 1997. And in 1997, not only were there 200 million fewer Chinese people than there are today, um, but the GDP of China was literally 5% of what it is today. And yet, even despite that, they are drinking less wine now than they were in 1997. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am. Um, I I I didn't entirely tell the truth when I said they're drinking less right now than they were in 1997. They are buying less wine now than they were in 1997. The fact is that only about two and a half percent of Chinese adults drink wine on like a monthly basis. It's not something that happens very often. If you look historically at Chinese wine consumption, what you're actually looking at is people buying bottles of wines for like Singles Day or Chinese New Year or some big, you know, Autumn Harvest Festival or something like that, and giving those bottles of wine as a present to someone else because it was a high status gift to give to someone uh... else. And then the recipient of the gift would be like, oh, wow, this is a very lo lovely bottle of wine. Thank you very much. And would stick it on the shelf and would never drink it. And basically the pandemic 
reduced the amount of gifting that people did because all of those social occasions, you know, got curtailed, but also just reset a lot of expectations. And people realized that this was a dumb gift because, you know, although there was a certain amount of sort of status attached to it, ultimately you don't want to give people something that they're not going to drink. So they just stopped giving wine. And so the people who drink wine in China are drinking more, but there aren't very many of them. And the total consumption of wine, as in the number of bottles purchased, is going down because most of it was never drunk in the first place. That is probably the most trivial thing we could have said about what's going on in China right now. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Just a- Priorities. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, like, you know, we could talk about major protests <laughs> against COVID shutdowns, right. or we could talk about wine consumption. Which one do you yeah, want to do? I mean, I think that th- we know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Elizabeth, do you have a number? Uh, yeah. So my number is 26 million, and it's the number of Americans 50 and older who live alone now, and this is up from 15 million in 2000. So, and they're mostly, uh, I mean, by, by definition, they're, they're a lot of Gen Xers. Um, I turn 46 next week, so I'm on the, the very young side of this. And, and my theory is that if, if this is a problem, that all the single Gen Xers should just move into communes together where they can play pavement 24-7 <laughs> and complain about boomers. So I, I, this doesn't depress me at all. I like the positive spin. Well, is, it, is it being reported as a depressing statistic? And the framing of the story was a little bit, because, I, and, and understandably because it has implications for healthcare and, and real estate and, you know, who takes care of these people when, as they're aging. Uh, so, so I guess in, in material terms, it's it's probably depressing. But I, I as an eternal optimist, <laughs> I, I, I refuse to not see a silver lining here. But Elizabeth, you said something interesting. You said it has implications for for real estate. What are the implications for real estate? Well, it's it's uh, you know what people can afford to buy as as single buyers and not you know two income households or you know people who have a, a, are in a better position to get a, you know a mortgage. So basically, the implications for real estate are that people won't be able to spend as much on real estate if they're single, and that therefore demand will be lower for high-priced houses, and that will help bring prices down at the margin. Sounds good, right? Yeah, in theory. <laughs> I'm, I'm just asking. I don't know, like, yeah. yeah, but but like, so well done, Gen Xers, for staying single because it helps to bring keep keep house price inflation low. <laughs> um, Emily, what's your number? My number is. $1,089,300. That is the new loan ceiling for federally backed mortgages. It's the first time it's crossed a million dollars and people are very excited and the Wall Street Journal is very upset about this new um, this new limit on conforming <laughs> loans. And this is just in like New York and California, right? Yes, it's just it's, in a couple it's of in high cost areas around the country. So right, New York, California, et cetera, there's like a list. And it's like 150% of the limit in other areas, which is still a very reasonable $726,000, which, which is a lot. Two years ago, um, the maximum for conforming loans was more like 500000 something like that. But home prices have gone up a lot. And so the Federal Housing Finance Association, they um, FHFA, they adjust these limits based on home prices. So they're realistic, even though the Wall Street Journal thinks they're, you know, a benefit for the rich or something. They're just realistic. Well, it is a benefit for the rich. Yeah, I mean, the fact true. is that <laughs> subsidized, subsidized mortgages are, are in general a benefit for the rich. Now, you know... They're not a benefit for the super rich. You get jumbo mortgages, who are even right. you know, which are even bigger than that. But they're definitely a, a benefit for you know upper middle classes, and b- broadly get a huge tax benefit from um, mortgage from thirty year mortgages based from, yeah. from, from from Fannie and Freddie and thirty year mortgages that is not given to people who Abs- rent or yeah, who can't afford true. houses. And and as that limit keeps on rising, the the size of that. Tax expenditure, effectively. Yeah, but it's good for stability. I mean, you see that now in the U.S. We have these 30-year mortgages compared to, like, the U.K., which has the more adjustable ones. And inflation and rising rates have really, like, messed with human beings and their homes and what they pay every month and their mortgage payments. 
in UK versus US Absolutely. where it's more stable. So that's kind of cool. I mean, the fact is that you have 30 year jumbos here, you know, that aren't federally backed. I feel like if you if you kept those limits below the pace of house price inflation and got fewer and fewer people getting conforming mortgages, that would at the margin again help to reduce house price inflation. It would make houses a little bit less affordable. I mean, you know, yeah, at high prices and that would help bring high prices down. I don't know, maybe. I'm not sure that seeing these numbers just go up and up is in anyone's interest, really, except for, of course, the 65% of Americans who are homeowners and who are much more than 65% of voters. Yeah. But yeah, on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up for this week, unless you are a Slate Plus member, in which case you get the happy, joyful news that we're going to talk about Balenciaga in Slate Plus. Um, for the rest of us, I think that's it. Many thanks to Anna Phillips for producing. Many thanks to all of you guys for writing in. Slate Money at Slate.com. And we'll be back next week on Slate Money. This episode of Slate Money is brought to you by Best Buy. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts or trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, Best Buy is here to help. From air fryers for the aspiring foodies in your life to smart watches your fitness friends will love, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next day delivery on thousands of items as well as same day delivery and in-store pickup options. So shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy.